and then you start, you see this, you know, the clattering projector. I mean, this is like out of the movies, you know, and then they're, they're showing uh, the F-117 flying and refueling and dropping weapons and all that kind of stuff. And, you, and you're looking at it going, oh, what the hell is that? <laughs> Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. At the beginning of the year, when I was getting ready to head out to the Pima Air and Space Museum, and we were discussing the partnership for this show, they announced that their F-117 stealth fighter was on the way. Scott Marchand, the boss out at Pima, then said to me, do you want to meet her pilot? And anyone who answered that question, no, has to question their AV geekery. So the chance to meet Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, USAF, retired, who not only flew F-117s during the first Gulf War, he also flew the incredible A-10. Now, the A-10 is just fantastic, and you're going to hear us talking quite a bit about that aircraft before we get to the stealth fighter or the black jet, as John calls it. And you're going to see there's a lot of affection for the hog. John was super generous with his answers. There was a couple of bits where we had to talk around things he wasn't sure he was allowed to talk about. But regardless of that, it was a great interview. We got out to the aircraft as well and had a little bit of a walk around. That will be coming as a video. Thanks to Ramon over at Boneyard Safari. And we've tagged the audio onto the end because it's a bit of fun. It's great to see. John talking about an aircraft that he actually flew. In this case, Dark Angel. So, I'm not going to hang around any longer. We're going to jump straight into the conference room at the Pima Air and Space Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous John Boyd. So, John, thank you for this. Um, sure. I guess let's start at the beginning. Why aviation? Why did you want to get into flying? What was what was that seed? Um... <laughs> I like the term because in some cases it may literally have been the seed. My father was a pilot. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and not only was a pilot, but he was, uh, he got his pilot's license in the 30s at the age of 16. Oh, wow. So very early on, a uh, very low number of pilot's license. As a matter of fact, I think I still have it somewhere at home. But um, the interesting thing about him as sort of a preamble was that um, as, a, as a pilot, and uh, a fairly experienced pilot at a young age when World War II began, like everyone else, he signed up to go. And they said, no, we want to keep you here because we want you to train other pilots. All right, okay. And so um, as, a, as a very young man in his 20s, uh, he was training, training people to go off to war and, and had to stay behind. Um, I never did get a straight answer from him whether that was okay with him or not, but, but that was the, the, you know, the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. So I guess then as you're growing up, you're around aviation, it's yes. fine. You, you, your dad's got his yeah. tales of, of, of training and things. And did he, did he teach you to fly or, um, <laughs> or did he tell you to go away and, and do something else? No, um, <laughs> the, well, the, the, the real seed for me, um, other than the joke of, you know, I probably have it in my, my genetics is that somewhere around the age of two, he took me up in a helicopter. He ended up being a helicopter pilot. That became his love. From um, the end of World War II, he was, he was involved with some of the very first helicopters. Okay. Uh, the R-4G, Sikorsky R-4G yep. um, in the Pacific. And then he was also T involved. Terribly flimsy looking things. Terribly flimsy and apparently uh, very finicky. Uh, he, and he was, when he finally got out into the Pacific, right at the end of the war, he was enlisted and became a mechanic on him and um, almost killed his commanding officer by accident, <laughs> <laughs> which was one of his first flying stories that he related. But, uh, but anyway, he then worked for uh, an oil field company in the 40s, 50s, doing geodetic survey, things like mm -hmm. that, with some of the, the recent uh, birds, primarily Bell products, uh, the, 40, the uh, 47 models, um, the one I'm most familiar with is the 47G, which I actually worked on when okay. I was in, in college. But he took me up for a ride as a two-year-old. And, of course, uh, with that big bubble canopy and, you know, the whole world is at your feet, literally, that makes an impression. There's no, no interruption to your view in, in those, are there? It's just 
No, yeah, it's, it's literally the quintessential bubble canopy. Um, and um, so, yeah, when, uh, and especially the, the thrilling part was he did an auto rotation oh, wow. without announcing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so once your stomach's up in your throat and your eyes are as big as plates, um, that, that also get, it got my attention and it was, when can we go again? <laughs> <laughs> so did you, had you learned to fly before you, you signed up for the Air Force or, or was that? Um, no, I, I did it in an conjunction with the Air Force. I ended up in ROTC yep. in Louisiana. And um, there, there's a program, if you are down the, the pilot track, uh, which I was, uh, you can get into something called FIP, which is the Flight Instruction Program. And the Air Force then pays for, I think it was about 20 or 25 hours of flight time okay. up through solo. So I did do that. Uh, my instructor, interestingly, was um, he was a young man, a little bit older than me, but he was also an ROTC. <clears throat> we also both worked at the flying service, where um, where we you know we were working mm -hmm. odd hours and weekends. And then he and I ended up going to the same pilot training class <laughs> once we did that. But um, I got about 25 hours up through solo with him and some cross country, and then I went ahead and on my own got my privates. Um, this would have been about 1975 okay. time frame. So I had my private uh, before entering the Air Force and was just flying enough to uh, keep currency, things like that, um, until I went in, which was um, um, early 77, 1977. Okay. So I suppose the question, this is a question I've learned very quickly to ask mm -hmm. most American Air Force chaps is, which university were you at? Well, <laughs> it, at, the day, at the time was called the University of Southwestern Louisiana, which we said, stands for you stand in line, <laughs> but it is now Ulala, La, which is the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, oh, right, because okay. it's down in uh, Acadian, mm -hmm. Acadiana, Cajun country, so there is some French spoken down there, but it's a patois. Yeah. So yes. um, it, it, that was certainly a, an education in itself growing up down there. Yes, Gr growing up in Canada, moving to England, and speaking Quebecois in, in French lessons yes. it doesn't doesn't go down well so i'm down yeah. with the patois well yeah. not anymore they beat the french out of me in english school but um well well there's an interesting story about that um uh part of part of our travels took us to uh, south america so as a as a now four or five year old i lived in bogota colombia oh, right. so i came back to the u.s speaking very fluent spanish and um, to, and mostly to children because the children were Spanish, but the adults that I was around were American and other European uh, type folks. And so I show up in Louisiana and start speaking Spanish to children who are speaking Patois French, who are sort of having it beat out of them. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone is looking strangely at me, like, so who who are you? <laughs> You're not speaking any language that we understand. So very quickly had to forget the Spanish and. Uh, for that matter, didn't learn that much of the French because uh, it was being pushed out at the yeah. time. Oh yeah, it's languages are funny things. But, it yeah, is, and I, I regret not keeping it up. But mm -hmm. yeah, peer pressure of you speaking something when your mates can barely say bonjour. Yeah, it's it's well, that's I don't speak languages fluently, but I'm told that I, I pronounce whatever I can say is is spoken like a native, and that usually gets me in trouble because then people begin speaking either. Yeah. French or Japanese or whatever to me, and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's all I know. Is the, <laughs> where's the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's talk about those early days. What what was the training like for a prospective pilot in the Air Force in, in middle middle late seventies? I, I guess what, oh, what was what was the process that you went through? Um, well, the the first part of the process was uh, was rather interesting in that this was the post Vietnam War, mm -hmm. so the Air Force had been rather large. A um, lot of people in uniform, a lot of pilots. The Vietnam War spun down. We don't need pilots anymore. So even in ROTC, there was very much a, a down selection process that if you didn't keep your grades up or if you looked a little funny or you know you had a cough or whatever, they would say, oh, well, we don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. So off, off you went. And, and so a lot of, uh, a lot of my uh, compatriot students um, ended up not graduating. Uh, when I went in, uh, it was late in the Vietnam War, into ROTC, probably about 75 uh, kids, I say kids, 
um, in our freshman class. I think when we graduated, there were four of us. Oh, wow. Of which I think I was the only pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was a, sort of a very severe neck down to get in there. And so those of us that showed up um, for that pilot training class in uh, early 77, uh, all felt pretty, uh, pretty grateful to be there. Mm -hmm. um, very small class, ended up being very tight knit. But uh, so the process then was one of, uh, interestingly, one, interestingly, once you got in the door, like the deal is, you know, I'm wearing glasses today, of course. But uh, back then it was, if you were 2020, you know, forget it. Mm -hmm. Uh, once you got in the door, if your eyes started to falter a little bit, it's like, oh, well, we'll just we'll get your glasses, and it's fine. So, so that was sort of the eye of the needle was to get into pilot training, and then as long as you could uh, handle the program, which was composed of all the different segments of, uh, we called it contact flying, which was flying outside, mm -hmm. acrobatics, stalls, spins, that type of thing, uh, instruments, um, formation, Cross country, um, and and each one of them was was geared to to sort of round you out for uh, for pilot training, and that, and at that time it was it was pretty much everybody was together in in the class, and then at the end of the class they began to then make choices who was going to go to heavies, who was going to go to fighters, who was going to go to something else like a, a Ford air control aircraft or a helicopter or something like that. I, I, I believe nowadays the tracks are fairly determined or they're they're like predetermined almost oh right okay so you're you're going into heavies or you're going to fighters and you're actually going to this base only um for, for that kind of training all right so i i do have a question yes sir you're you're a gentleman of stature you're you're quite tall <laughs> yeah. and well thank you yes I, as, as as someone who has, has a bit of height myself yes but that's not always usual for a fighter pilot so that's correct. How did that? I guess you. How does that work? Yeah, how does that work? I, I guess you were shit hot, sir. I suppose is the the technology. Well, the first the first word is that you have to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> um, the limit at that time was six feet four, mm -hmm. and I knew I was over the limit, but I did a lot of slouching. Uh, when it came time for um, my commissioning physical. Got up on the scale, and they put the little the measuring stick up, I'm slouching away, and the, the sergeant who was taking the measurements is not impressed. <laughs> so he then jabs me in the back with his thumb, you know, and says, cadet, you're going to have to, you know, stand up a little straighter. So I e e e stand up a little straighter, and uh, he goes, did you know you're over the limit? I went, no, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so I was over the limit, and so I thought, well, I'm done. Uh, but we had uh, this one particular officer in the ROTC detachment who was like Radar O'Reilly from MASH. He knew every regulation that the Air Force had. He says, no, there's a regulation where you, we can get you a waiver. And so they put in for the waiver, and I had to go to San Antonio, get measured at, uh, I believe it was uh, Brooks. Um, uh, I can't remember that. Brooks Air Force Base, big medical place. Mm -hmm. And, but then the other thing is I <clears throat> had to go to Randolph, sit in the cockpit, get measured. And I think the thing that saved me was there was a uh, there was an instructor from both T-37 and T-38s who was also sort of a another input. Mm -hmm. And I guess the guys were kind of like, if the kid wants it that bad, then what the hell. But uh, anyway, the, the whole deal was when they looked at my at my sitting height, I was slouching like this. When they looked at my knees, I was like this. And so I got a waiver to uh, six feet five inches, and the measurement that I had was six four and three quarters, <laughs> and my actual height is six foot seven. So, <laughs> so uh, that's a story I tell people that um, if you really want to do something, find a way to go do it. And so that that's. So I cheated, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and find somebody who knows the regs. Somebody knows the regs, knows how to work the system, and then and then go go follow it. Go follow your dream. Fantastic. So what were those early days flying? What were you flying in training? Is, is always a, a good, fun, airplane um, the, question. The, the primary jet trainer was the T-37, mm -hmm. um, colloquially called the Tweet. Um, the reason for that is uh, the technology in the jet engines was 1950s era um, 
centrifugal flow engines, which also double as air raid sirens. Yep. And uh, basically, that's where you get your first taste of hearing damage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we wore earmuffs and earplugs, the foam earplugs, and it still didn't help. The, the, the noise penetrates your, your, your bone, your skull, and still causes the damage. So the, the primary jet tweet, um, rugged as hell. Um, I stayed as an instructor there, and we had a student inadvertently land <clears throat> gear up. He landed on the speed brake and the flaps, and uh, the only thing they had to do was replace the speed brake and the flaps, and it was flying within a couple of weeks. So, so tough airplane. Perfect trainer, then. Perfect trainer, side-by-side uh, -side seating, and as an instructor, I found out why that was important. It was so you could get to the student. Um, if you had to, uh, sometimes students would uh, would lock up, literally, um, especially in the, the T-37 is kind of low and squat and Frisbee-like because it was, it, was, it was designed to spin. It's very stable, but you could put it in a spin and keep it there with certain pro-spin controls. The process was to do another set of control inputs to get it out of the spin, <clears throat> but while you're coming down at some horrendous rate, uh, swirling toward the ground, sometimes students kind of get there, especially with their hands fully forward or their arms fully forward, you have to recover from the dive. Mm -hmm. And so it was very easy to reach over and karate chop them in the elbow to make the stick come out of full forward <laughs> <laughs> so you could recover. So um, anyway, tough airplane meant for uh, spins and disorientation and that type of stuff so that once you got into other kinds of aircraft, you could A, avoid getting into it in the first place, and B, hopefully get yourself out of it. Like the T-38, you didn't spin the T-38. That was, you weren't coming out of that if you ever spun it. So, so that, I guess, is quite a big jump. You, you, you're getting the yourself, and when you're then instructing the trainee, used to a situation that they have a chance of, of getting out of should they get themselves in trouble. Yes, yeah. yes. So how long did you instruct? Uh, we graduated in March of 78 and uh, stuck around there, checked out as an IP, and then left there uh, about March, April of 81, so okay. three years, three and a half, four years, something like that. What's your lasting memory of going from a trainee to an instructor? Did you have... <laughs> more more sympathy for the guys you were training as you no, no I had plenty of sympathy for me because um, the 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 very the very odd it's a it's a critical mass kind of an issue so you're a second lieutenant you graduated from pilot training you've been taught how to instruct but you're still a second lieutenant and you know the meter is not counted up very high as far as flight hours and so now you're taking the hand of another second lieutenant and both of you are going out to get in an airplane and both of you are, are still apt to try and kill each other. So the first six months, um, there were a couple of very near-death experiences, some of which were student-caused, some of which were not necessarily me-caused, but my lack of what the hell's going on. You know, you're still yeah. kind of figuring that out. But the, the good news is, is having the wherewithal to get out of it yeah. and then uh, be able to tell the tale. Cool, we're here. So yeah. cl clearly, it was a successful few years. Yeah, training. yeah. But sometimes it was. It wasn't. You know. So, you know that God is my co-pilot thing. Sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's just the roll of the dice. You know, a couple more inches, a half a second here or there, and nope, not here to tell the tale and share a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? Yeah, what happens next? Well, myself. So what, where where do you go from? You've done your stint. As an instructor, mm -hmm. you're now going to, I guess, what we would call over there, on the line. Yeah. Where do you, where do you get posted? What aircraft are you sent to? Um, the A-10. Mm -hmm. And I came right here to Davis Mountain. Uh, the, the replacement training unit, training unit, RTU, was here. Mm -hmm. It still is here. And um, so, yeah. Um, so the A-10's pretty, still pretty new by that point, isn't it? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, well, before before I got, I got to the A-10 in the summer, uh, there was a stint, a quick shot over to Holloman Air Force Base for fighter lead-in training. And uh, what they had done was uh, set up a unit there with um, uh, an aircraft called the AT-38. Mm -hmm. And it was a T-38, but it had, a, pile, it had a, a pylon on the bottom that you could also put a weapons uh, a 
pile on with practice bombs. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a bomb site, a very crude, almost World War II era bomb site, just a, a, a heads up with a depressible paper, yeah. and that was about it. Everything else was read in the cockpit as you were throwing yourself at the ground. <laughs> but yeah, flew, flew the A-10, um, Warthog, but pretty much the hog is yeah. what you say. It, it's been lovely to, to watch them fly around as I've been walking around the museum the mm -hmm. last few days, because the last time I saw one was 1991 okay. at, at Biggin Hill Air Show. Mm -hmm. So af after, after the first golf with everybody coming back, Right, there was sort of the, the sort of victory, the victory tour of, sure. of that, and having only seen it on the news, and then to see one in person is is quite something because it's it's very imposing. It is, yeah. And I I, I remember my, my dad saying, "My goodness, that's an ugly airplane." <laughs> and I I looked at it and yeah. having a, a very strange love of ground attack aircraft. Mm -hmm. The Ty, Hawker Typhoon is my wife calls it my obsession. Mm -hmm. I like to think she's my obsession, but. Apparently not. Um, but you look at it, and it is the culmination of all of those years of learning, isn't it? The, the mm -hmm. A-10 to, to create this weapons platform for, for ground attack. What what would she like to f fly and live with? The reason the reason the A-10 is so ugly is because um, one of the key members of the advisory board who made inputs on the design of this was Hans Rudell. Mm -hmm. And some of you aviation enthusiasts might know who Hans Rudel was, but he was um, uh, the, the Stuka pilot mm -hmm. and with the book of the same title. And so he had spent, you know, I can't remember, he had like 1,500 sorties on the Eastern Front yeah. in Stukas, primarily going against Soviet armor. So he was the expert on Soviet armor, and back in those days, we were still very concerned about Soviet armor. So... Hans Rudell said, you're going to need this and this and this and this. And so all those things ended up making the A-10 look the way it was. So you had, uh, you know, there's an old saying about uh, designing an airplane to take hits is, is stupid. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yeah, but if you get hit, it's going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the, and, and there's a, a, he wasn't a good friend of mine, but a, a guy I know, uh, Johnson, he was a student, and uh, I think he ended up being the wing commander out here. But he took a 57 millimeter hit to the wing route during the Gulf War and walked away from, I mean, flew away from it. And who the hell does that? How do you take a 57 millimeter hit to anything and live to tell about it? But he did. And that's because he's flying the hog. So, so there, for those of you that don't like the A-10. I, I, I don't trust people who don't like the A-10. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's, it, yes, it, yes, it can It be. is a blunt instrument, mm -hmm. and it is meant to be a blunt instrument. And, that, and sometimes the best thing to use in a fight is a blunt instrument. Yeah. You know? It gets people's attention. It designed to do a job and does, does the job well. Very well. Yeah. So... I guess, you know, I'm going to ask some geeky questions. Sure. So, you know, we, we, I've been out here a few days, and you can, you hear the F-16s going off, rat, mm -hmm. rattling the coffee mugs, and the, the A-10s go off, and it's a very distinct sound with the, yeah. the big turbofans on, on the back. Mm -hmm. Going in, in into flying an aircraft like that, is it going to be much different from, say, the, a direct thrust from an uh, after-burning engine to, to something that's probably more recognizable to people on, a, on an airliner? Um, well, yeah, it's not an airliner engine, obviously, but sure. it's similar. Um, the the interesting thing about at least my career was I came out of the T thirty seven, having flown that for quite a few years, and and you were always having to kind of coax the airplane to do things. Mm -hmm. You had to manage your energy. You, had, you couldn't just turn a square corner and just yeah, well, energy will come right back. No, it won't. You had to work it, and so all of a sudden you're in the A ten, and especially once you start carrying a heavy load. You're coaxing it, so um, I felt that mentally I was well prepared to kind of have a conversation. Come on, baby, <laughs> we, we got to get over that ridge, or you know that type of thing. Um, so yeah, you were always managing your energy. Um, the 38 was always a hoot because you know you put it in burner and you watch the nozzle swing and it kind of pushes you back in the seat. I mean, there there's nothing like that, but you know. It's a sports car, yeah. and this was a this was a dump truck, and, and so yeah, you, you were going to go do a dump truck kind of work with it, 
and um, and you just you had to be thinking ahead all the time because you didn't know if you were going to have the energy to get away with something. Um, turn on a dime for about three seconds, and then it was going to turn on a fifty dollar bill. It was <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking of other things to do. So it's going to allow you to make a, a rapid change to get out of a certain bit of trouble, but yes. after that, you then have to really work to get it to yeah. keep going. Yeah. So I, I know the people listening to this are waiting for this question, which is about the gun. On the <laughs> and so that's one of those best fun things you can do with your clothes on. <laughs> that gun. Well, I family show. <laughs> let's, let's, let's move swiftly on. No, let, let's, no, no. Uh, let's, 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 not, ask, let's let, talk about that some more. Yeah. So you yeah, know, it's it's. Again, it's one of those things that has, has come up over the last year with, with mm -hmm. Ukraine and things like that. It's like, oh, if there was A-10s, it would be fine. But how do you position yourself to effectively use that remarkable Gatling gun um, on, on the targets? When, when, when you're training, when you're getting... You know, in, in, in the 80s, as you were preparing, to, preparing for possible Soviet armor, yeah. what's the process to set up to, to use that? Well, back in the day, um, we trained primarily something called low angle strafe. Mm -hmm. And it was because you had to get in close, even with that gun, you had to get in fairly close against the main battle tank to, uh, to, to finish it. And um, it, was, uh, it was one of those things where when you're on the range, that, that's, I mean, so dropping the bombs and whatever, we were dropping practice bombs, shooting rockets. But shooting the gun in low angle strafe was one of those uh, Jedi Knight kind of things. You had to, you had to, because you were going to go down. I think the min altitude was 75 feet. You could go down to 75 feet, and the foul line was at about 2,000 feet, <clears throat> maybe from the target. You had to come off at 2,000 feet, and so um, you would line all that up. And again, back in the day, the 80s. Um, they hadn't put any kind of lead computation or any any special stuff. It was an iron sight. Yeah. So then you mentally had to be working on mark, bill mark, ranging. Yeah. Mark one eyeball, mark one computer. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, and basically knowing, so how far am I from the tank? And I have to know that because the tank is so long and it's so big and the heads up display, gun cross is all set. I know that depending on which rate it's going, it's going to throw the bullets in a certain certain torque and so forth. And so, yeah, you're kind of working all that as you're roaring down the chute to then squeeze off a half a second burst. And, uh, and then in this case, it was, um, it was just a drag chute with a microphone and it would count the, um, it had a certain decibel level you had to hit with the bullet, basically supersonic uh, booms going by that would that count as a hit or not. All right, okay. Um, so, but we, we got to be where it was a standard bet on the range, a quarter bomb, nickel hole. And so for every every hit you got was worth a nickel, and then at the end of the, the ride, you'd say, okay, who got whatever. And if you weren't shooting close to 100%, you didn't win. 100% hits right. at 2,000 feet. The closing speed of that, to do all those calculate, that that's just... I, I guess you get you get used to it. Oh, yeah, but, but sure. For, for, for a layman like me who struggles to tot yeah. up what tip to put on a bill. It's we were um, <clears throat> coming down to shoot here in in, uh, in, in Arizona, you, somewhere around 325, mm -hmm. 325 knots. Uh, cold day like today, might be getting 350, 360, mm -hmm. and it also depends on how much other crap you were carrying, yeah. you know, the drag and so forth. But over 300 knots coming down the chute, um, I don't know, do the math, uh, yeah. one knot's worth 60 feet a second, I seem to remember, so. Those of you that are, want to geek out about that, <laughs> yeah, out your calculators. Uh, but not a lot of time. And then, of course, if something goes wrong, you then have to be able to mm. to sort that out. This this might be a, a silly question, but in, in those sort of situations, to get yourself out of trouble, was is it a particularly forgiving aircraft when you're in that very tight environment? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Um, one of the other reasons I told people we call I called it the hog was that it loved to put its snout in the ground. So if you banked it up with that big wing, you and the heavy gun in the nose, the nose would immediately make a bid for the ground. So you always had to think about that. And if you weren't paying attention, if you were like looking over your shoulder for a, some you know a 
opponent aircraft coming after you and you weren't paying attention to the nose angle at three to 500 feet, which is what we, we flew 500 feet. I stayed here as an instructor later, by the way. 500 feet with students, 300 feet with uh, another instructor. Um, not many seconds before you're in the ground if you're not paying attention. So looking over your shoulder and turning in the airplane was, was a death-defying act. And to just pick up on, on that other point, it's, it's still quite, should we say, traditional avionics on it. So it's not, when you were going after the, the, the training targets, it's something that would have been akin to hands back in the day, really. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, the airplane I flew here in 1981 had that same heads-up display. It was, it was a little bit prettier because it was bigger and it was green rather than it was smaller and white in AT-38. Mm -hmm. But you read your dive angle out of the corner of your eye in the ADI. You were watching the altimeter spinning down. All of that was what you were deciding was, I think there was a, a, a couple of ladders. There, were a set, there was an altitude and an airspeed scale mm -hmm. on either side of the pipper. But that was it. And so you had to sort that all out um, in real time, in your head, and then try and, and get the weapon off, whatever it was. And I have to ask you about rockets, because mm -hmm. that's second, second most fun. Yeah. yeah. So the, un, the unguided rocket is one of those things that, you know, for, from the Second World War, say with the, the three-inch British rocket, the, mm -hmm. the five-inch um, uh, H-5 on the, on, the, on the U.S. side, is one of those things that has a, a story and a myth around it, but they're essentially fireworks with a shell on the, mm -hmm. on the end of them. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, had they changed much by the, the 80s when you start firing off the modern, their modern descendants? Um. Essentially, no. Um, ours was 2.75 inch mm -hmm. rocket, and uh, I think it's just that there were still plenty of rockets in the inventory, so we had to stay current with it. We generally shot uh, Willie Peets, white mm -hmm. phosphorus. Uh, later, when I came back to the A-10 for my final tour, um, it was the OA-10, so it had the observation or for forward air control role as well. Yeah. And so then we were using it for real mm -hmm. as a marking round. Um, when we were uh, controlling other fighters, things like that. So it was the second most fun thing? Well, well forward firing yeah. ordnance. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the gun, 2.75, and the AGM-65 Maverick. Mm -hmm. um, very satisfying to watch something just blow to flinders when you hit it with a Maverick. It, it's, it makes a big hole. That, that's another one of those sort of boys only sort of weapons. I, I, I don't know. You, you play the simulators and things, you, you'd always make sure you tick the box to have Mavericks on board. Mm -hmm. Again, I guess that's that next leap on for it. So you, you, is that more of a standoff or, or are you doing the same sort of calculations to get that? Because again, in our mind from, yeah. you know, from watching the news, it's one of these things that we were told that you just point in the right direction and, and off it goes. Well, you have to be careful what you ask for because after I retired, I worked that program for Raytheon missile systems here. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was quite an easy step to say, oh, yeah, yeah I know that. And, and the, the good news, bad news was, is like I got to learn a lot about the internal workings of all the different models mm -hmm. and, and then even help work on some uh, some new ones. But the, the short answer to your question was you um, you had to, there was a, a different mindset with that. It, it was a, it was a video game. Um, and, and again, Harking back to that time frame, there was only the, the what we call the EO or electro optic Maverick, which mm -hmm. was TV. It was a yep. television camera, but it was contrast driven, and then you had to know what the what kind of contrast will it accept or will it not accept. So, if you understood that, you could get some more standoff on it, uh, but you weren't like in the next county. You were still kind of eyeball to eyeball, but the point being that when a when a a Maverick with a hundred and that particular model, A and B model, 125 pound shape charge hits something. It it was not just for tanks; it was for, it was anti ship as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a tank is kind of like toast. Ruins your day. Yep. 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 So, at what point does a gentleman walk up and make you an offer to fly something else? I think is a, a good entry point to the, the next stage of your well, career. Well, that, that's, a, it's a, that's another interesting story is nobody makes you an offer. 
um, the you, there's just you kind of smell something in the wind. Uh, the, it started with me when I was still in my first A10 assignment um, in uh, Louisiana, Ale Alexandria, or um, England Air Force Base, Alexandria. And one of the guys who had been there, he, you know, people come and go. He went off to an assignment, disappeared. <clears throat> and towards the end of that assignment, uh, I see him in the club on a Friday night. And he's in civilian clothes. Hey, you know, how's it going? What do you do? Oh, well, we're, we're just cross country. You know, he's just very matter of fact. What are you flying? He says, oh, we got a, a, an MU-2, Mitsubishi, out on the line. MU, Mitsubishi MU-2 is a civilian turboprop aircraft. Oh, yeah, what are you doing about that? Oh, well, a little testing, that kind of thing. And then you just kind of go, okay. And then I, uh, <clears throat> I went from Alex, <clears throat> we call it Alec, uh, England Air Force Base to here as an instructor. Somebody else disappears. And then you see him come back and, you know, what are you doing? And I'm up in Dallas, and, you know, doing some test stuff. Oh, yeah? With who? 4450th. Oh, okay. Who's that? You know, you get that kind of, so, but after about two or three or four, it's like, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> <laughs> something's going on. But, and, and of course, everybody's very tight-lipped about, because it's, it's test and it's classified. Okay. And, and, you know, when you're in the military, you go, yeah, well, classified. Got it. Uh, but then one of those guys came back and he said, and it was like, so are you having fun? He says, he says, uh, yeah, if you get a chance, you should, you should try this. And I went, okay, I kind of file that away. And then, um, when it came time for uh, my next assignment out of here, it would have been, uh, around 1986, 87 timeframe. I said, well, put in for the 4450th. And, um. The, the interesting story about that was other another path was people would leave and go to the guard or the reserves, flying. There were eight ten units, and um, I had an in sort of with um, the New Orleans reserve unit, mm -hmm. um, having come from Louisiana, kind of thing. So I was talking with them, and then um, at some at some point, um, I remember sitting at my desk and the phone rings. Hey, this is uh, Major So and So from the forty three fiftieth. How you doing? Hey, I'm all right. You know, uh, Ernst Chain, you're interested. Uh, yes, I am. I, I know a couple guys, and I mean, I haven't. I don't know anything about what's going on, obviously, but uh, it seems like a pretty intriguing job. And it's just one of those things where you're yakking and speaking very frankly, mm -hmm. almost like you and I are. And then at the end of it, you kind of go, "What just happened?" And that was the job interview. Yeah. Um, the the other interesting part was. Um, they they had a lot of pull. They were selectively manned, and so if you if you got that offer, you were going to go. And um, at the same time, I was like, well, I'm talking to the to the reserve unit. Somebody called, and I, I kind of sat there and took a deep breath. And said, well, what am I going to do? You know, which road? Yeah. And I said, whoever calls first. And this guy called me back, a couple months, you know, whatever. You forget about it. Hey, you still want to come work? Sure. Yeah. Whatever. You're the first guy to call me back. He goes, well, who else was going to call you back? I said, well, the New Orleans uh, Reserve guys. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. You know, we'd like to have you over here. I came. Cool. A week later, the phone rings. Hey, <laughs> we got a spot for you in the guard in the reserve unit here. I'm like, oh, dude. <laughs> um, uh, I'm staying in. The 4450th called, and someone going to do that. Oh well, you know. Have a nice day. Well, then personnel center kicked in and said, well, you have not been overseas, sir. So your next job, your next assignment is to go overseas. And I went, okay, well, uh, I've seen a lot of guys bail from the, the remote tour in Korea for the A-10. What if I go do that with a follow-on, guaranteed follow-on back to the 4450th? He says, well, if they'll take you, that's fine. But you're, you're saying you'll take the, the, the Korean job? I went, sure. And so it's a one year. So I had to make a hard left go um, go west to uh, Korea for a year, which turned out to be an outstanding assignment. I mean, you're away from your family and all that stuff, but the flying and the camaraderie is second to none. And then make another U-turn and come back to then go into the black jet. And the black jet, of course, is the F-117? F-117, yes. What is, this is a terrible question, and I've been thinking about it for days, <laughs> and I can't figure out, what is that like when you arrive 
the 44 50th and they take you in and show you well first of all or, or what happens yeah. before they show you yeah. the aircraft is well, probably the better like, question it's like well okay you you know you you got the assignment um and um uh, the first thing you had to do was come back here to Tucson one more time. So <laughs> uh, the companion trainer um, and also part of the cover story was the A7. Mm -hmm. And the, the last uh, major A7 uh, school was here at mm -hmm. uh, Tucson International at the Garden Reserve Unit there. Yeah. So I came back from Korea back to my, my home here. My, my family was still here. And then was TDY to Tucson to learn to fly the A7. And then... Um, at some point, they would. They said, um, "I can't remember how many guys we had. Maybe six of us here who were training in the A7. Um, so on this day, um, you're not going to fly sevens. There's going to be a C12 pick you up, take you up to Nellis, um, go up there for the day. Okay, you know, again, very not much detail. And then so you. So seems rather matter of fact. Rather matter of fact, but rather just like yeah, we just. We're just not talking about anything, mm -hmm. and you, you kind of get used to, okay, we're not talking about anything. But um, C-12 lands at Nellis. Um, the 4450th building is there, and they've got the big patch with the lightning bolts, and there's a big line of A-7s out there. And it's all very uh, up and up test unit. You go into the, the building, which has no windows, and um, they, you know, greet you and everything. And I think, I, I think we were, I can't remember, we were in flight suits. I think we were wearing flight suits. Um, um, but yeah, we're going to go in the vault, and most times, you know, like an A-10 squadron, the vault is like this, you know, ain't much bigger than a gun safe kind of thing mm -hmm. where they keep some classified stuff. Well, this vault is about like this room. <laughs> it's another part of the building, and it's just all this classified stuff going on. And so you're meeting people and going on in and say, well, so here's the deal. Um, you have to sign that you're not going to disclose all this stuff and whatever and then if you don't want to sign that then you're done and you can there's the door kind of thing like okay so you know you read it and it's pain of death and all that not really but you know, <laughs> uh, all near, the bad, near, near his damn it yeah yeah and all the bad stuff can happen if you if you divulge this so then you sign it and say okay i've, I've done it i've signed it and they uh they have a an old, it's, you know, one of those of the movie projectors with film, you know, like eight millimeter film or something. And it's like, man, you know, we're in the age where we're moving, you know, we're going to videotape and all that kind of stuff. So they got film, what the heck? So they just kill the lights, turn it on, and it's uh, there's no there's no sound. It's just they said this is what we're doing. And then you start you see this, you know, the clattering projector. I mean, this is like out of the movies. You're like. And then they're they're showing uh, the F-117 flying and refueling and dropping weapons and all that kind of stuff. And, you, and you're looking at it going, what the hell is that? <laughs> because it does not look like an airplane. And uh, even when you're looking at it, it still doesn't look like an airplane because it's just the angles are so messed up. And um, then they they kind of then tell you, the here's, here's how it works, here's what it's about. And um, what do you think? And you're kind of like... You okay. Do yeah, I, I do want to go do this. <laughs> you're, you're glad you signed the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so off you go. I guess the training for it is probably different to how you would approach very more, convention, very more conventional aircraft. Very because much. Um, because, okay, it's it's a stealth aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so that everything, everything else is a secondary consideration except for maybe staying airborne, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had to gear everything to being stealthy, and there were there were good and bad ways of accomplishing that. And then you you learned what were the best ways, and um, uh, and the other the other thing that was a huge uh, change was that the system integration in that aircraft was beyond anything I'd ever seen. So you had to know the systems backward and forward, and then you had to know when. And this this still bothers me to, to, till today. You talked about the drone thing, which mm -hmm. we'll get to, is all those computers. <laughs> They're all thinking and talking in computer, and and um, and you have to kind of decipher when it is their 
sane and when it is they're not sane. And sometimes they weren't sane. They would they would go off on some other tangent. It's like, why why is that doing that? And oh, that's not working. Why is that not working? How can I get it back? And so instead of coming down the chute to strafe something, you're you're in menus and pushing buttons and trying to say, well, let me see if I can reset this or let me see if I can figure out why it's doing that or how can I get around that problem to make everything work. When it, everything worked, it was it was magical. When it didn't work, it was it was uh, sometimes life threatening. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you sort of have to add systems engineer almost to, to yeah. pilot as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was the first flight in it like? Because I'm I'm, I'm guessing there's no two seat trainer. You just sort of that's true, but I had already gotten over that because the A10 is all single seat. So ah, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. My first flight in the A10 way back in '81 was don't break it. You you better do this right because you know <laughs> there's nobody going to help you but you. There's a guy. There's an instructor in another airplane watching. <laughs> so in that respect, I was like, okay, yeah, I've done this single seat kind of thing. Uh, a little bit more expensive aircraft and a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> of uh, a limited number of them out there, so still don't break it. But uh, yeah, that part was like, oh, and oh, oh, by the way, not ascent, not overly thrust endowed yeah. either. So um, between that and being up at uh, Tonopah, which you're way up, oh, you're higher than Denver, like 6,000 and some change. So yeah, um, I didn't even realize until much later that the airplane did quite well down at sea level, but I never flew it at sea level <laughs> until, uh, until I brought it home, until I brought it home from, from uh, the desert. What's it like to fly? Because it, you know, we, we sit, so we're talking about how the A-10 looks. Mm. As you were saying, it's, it's, a, it's a strange jumble of geometric shapes. Mm -hmm. So how does that, when you sort of finally get it, get it up in the air, what is it like? Is it's even when you see footage of it flying, it doesn't look like it should be doing what it's doing. That's that's correct. And um, and again, it's not a. You're not going to go out and dogfight anybody mm -hmm. in an F one seventeen. <laughs> that's not what it's for. And and so you just have to constantly remind yourself that, you know, um, I'm tiptoeing around. I'm being sneaky, and I want to stay sneaky and tiptoe. And I don't want anybody to see me. So you're, you know, you kind of have that kind of a mentality. So you're blending. But the, again, now I'm in my th third, actually fourth aircraft that's not overpowered. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, if you want to do a hard 90 degree turn, it'll do it. But you have probably just kind of told everybody, yeah. hello, here I am. So then you didn't do that. So um, it was all still very blended, very gentle, very... Um, stealthy, you know, sneaking around as opposed to announcing yourself like with an A-10. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Fairchild A-10 Thunderbolt II or Warthog. Um, the A-10 was designed specifically as a tank buster ground attack aircraft. Um, it's one of those aircraft that's kind of has pretty good story. I mean, people either really love this aircraft because it's kind of unique. I mean, they got a titanium bathtub that the pilot's sitting in to protect him. Got a 30 mil millimeter Gatling gun that fires um, 4,200 rounds per minute, which means they can run out of ammo pretty quickly, short bursts. Um, <clears throat> could carry a slew of different types of weapons. And it's been upgraded over the years. These early A models had really kind of limited um, sensors and targeting equipment it was kind of really kind of brute force um, but over the years they've upgraded them and made them more adaptable for night combat and uh, firing more high-tech weapons it's an aircraft that to be fair the air force has often tried to get rid of um, which is why i think a10 pilots are kind of a unique breed of pilots because they kind of always feel like they're uh, the ones that the air force is you know they're not they're not flying the pointy fast jets and stuff like that. But, you know, in Desert Storm, and then again in the Middle East, the A-10 really proved itself. Um, 
you know, the A-10 was often the aircraft that ground troops would call in specifically when they needed ground support. Sometimes just the A-10 coming in, firing its cannon and quick burst was enough to disperse enemy forces. But, and also here in Tucson, Arizona, we are kind of what they consider the spiritual home for the A-10. Davis Mothin Air Force Base has always been the training base and the big base for A-10s. Um, that has allowed us over the years to, you know, foster a lot of good relationships with A-10 pilots. Um, another interesting exhibit we have here is the Bing, which is all the stuff that they brought back from Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. They essentially had their own little pilots club. Um, so all the patches that they would leave and uh, unit uh, memorabilia was brought back here for us to recreate a kind of display of their officers club. So. The A-10 here is kind of the heart of our Arizona aviation exhibit for good reason. And now, back to the show. What's that like for a pilot? So you know, you've come from the A-10, which mm -hmm. you can you can muscle around a bit. Yeah. Are, are you having to un unlearn a lot of your your natural reaction as a as a pilot? Um, no, because by the time by the time you got to the airplane, by the flying the airplane. Mm -hmm. Um, you you kind of got it, and, and so yeah, you're you're you the, the the big deal is uh, the mission is, is bombs on target, yep. and and bombs on target where I would hazard guess that nobody else is going to go put a bomb on that <laughs> target, at least not hauling their pink body over it. You know they might you know lob one from several hundred miles away, but we're the only people that are going to go in there and. Spot it, spot it, it, and do it um, eye to eye with it. So yeah, that's it's what is the objective? What is the mission? And there were a couple of times, even during the war, when I went, okay, you know, what is the objective? And then how do I make the airplane and myself do that so that we all get to come back and, and tell the tale? So, in a very short space of time, the enemy that you're expecting to maybe one day fight disappears and another one in a completely different part of the world pops up mm -hmm. and yeah it's in the space of 18 months two two right. years what what was that sort of period like when the soviet union's collapsing the the mission profiles you've been you've been training for change or do no. they are you I'll still say no not no, really. really no no um Baghdad was as well defended or more well defended than any of the other people we were looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly from the from standpoint of AAA, mm -hmm. there wouldn't anybody had as much AAA as Baghdad did. So in that respect, no, it didn't change. Okay. So that 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 sort of the you know, the, the Desert Shield, Desert Storm mm -hmm. deployment heading out. I guess that's when yeah, I, I I remember here back in the day there was a computer game called F nineteen Stealth Fighter that had a mm -hmm. very strange looking stealth fighter. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a lot of hoo ha about it. Yes. It was only about a year later after that came out that suddenly on the news on CNN there was you and your friends in actual stealth fighters that looked nothing like Microprose did in that game. Mm -hmm. What was what was that like, having been in a, a covert program for so long, to suddenly being heralded as this wonder weapon? It was uh, it was it was very interesting because by that time I, that was late in my tour, um, two and a half years into a three year tour, and you've been around the jet, you know, you've seen its its good points and its bad points, and live, again lived to tell the tale. But it was um, it was it was still just a, it, I hate to say it, it was still just a, a job. It mm. was the job that you that you did, and you were trained very well to do it. And so we were pretty matter of fact about yeah, you know, um, I, I, they did. So there there was there was a bit about. Um, you had to have, have a thousand hours. You had to have a thousand hour fighter pilot fly that airplane. And it turns out because it would kill you if you weren't careful. You were flying at night, and if and and if things went bad, you were going to be very um, hard put to get it back on the ground in one, in one piece. 
um, disorientation, all that kind of stuff that happens at night. Um, so in that respect, they weren't taking second lieutenants yep. from Davis Monthan or from you know, uh, Laughlin Air Force Base. <laughs> uh, so I don't think anybody was lower than a captain who went in there at the time because it took that long to get about a thousand hours. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was there was just the aspect of, yeah, there's stuff that we don't talk about. I mean, even back before it became public knowledge, it was the, the most interesting thing to go to a party down south in, in Las Vegas with your families because nobody talked about flying. <laughs> <laughs> nobody even talked about anything, you know. And as a matter of fact, you never even said the airplane or the, it was the asset. If you even spoke that word, um, probably still in sort of, you know, hushed tones or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it was just a question of, okay, I'm used to saying nothing to anybody. And so there is, I guess the line moved a little bit so I can say stuff about this. But beyond that, you just kind of went, you just kind of smiled and shrugged and said, no. What do you know about this? Nowadays, I say, nothing. <laughs> and people go, really? No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, well, let's dig into that nothing a little bit. Yeah. The, the, you know, you're saying Baghdad, not a friendly place to visit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be correct, sir. Um, what were those... Did you did you go in on, on the first night or were were you No, I was uh I went in on the second night and we we generally had uh I don't remember the total number of aircraft. We ended up with just about everything over there before the war was over. Mm -hmm. Um fifty ish airplanes. But we had enough um pilots to uh go every other night. Okay. Because there were other jobs. There was a lot of mission planning that was done. There was supervisory duties, which I was an assistant operations officer of one of the squadrons at the time, so you had to have somebody up in the tower as the supervisor flying, or there was another spot in the command post. And so people had to do those ground duties. Mm -hmm. um, so my first night, um, I was, I, I guess you'd call me the launch control officer for my squadron. Um, and so the, the guys who were going, we had, uh, you know, they had laid out all these airplanes, all these weapons, all this stuff, and, uh, and basically what I ended up doing was hot pre-flighting every one of those aircraft <laughs> right. and checking, checking the weapons, checking, checking everything, making sure that when, when the guy comes out, it's all going to work. And we still even had some spares just in case it didn't work. But I hot pre-flighted all those aircraft. And then as the launches began to go, it was like, okay, that guy left, that guy left. And it was all being done on, on the clock. Mm -hmm. Nobody was saying a word on yeah. the radio. And then all of a sudden, that airplane's not moving. Why isn't it moving? Then we'd go sort that out. And, uh, and so we got everybody up uh, the first night. That was, that was my job. As a, and myself and the maintenance officer were both in the truck. and Rushing about. Rushing about, making sure that happened. So then second night comes around, now it's my turn. And then you have to kind of breathe up for it <laughs> and get ready and go do it. So this, this, you'd have been in for, what, 10, 12 years by this point, right about? Uh, 77 to yeah. 91. 15. 14, 15? I don't know. See, this is, this is why I never became a pilot. Yeah. Um, you're an experienced pilot. You've been training constantly for all mm -hmm. those years. What's that first actual operation like? Are you, are you not thinking better or because you've been training for it for so long, it's let's just do the job? The first mission? You yeah. Mean? Um, yeah, the, well, the, you know, there, there's the constant concern of have, have the slide rules and the computers and the design stuff worked. Mm -hmm. That was always for, the forefront of everybody's mind. I mean, the sort of the, the, the single syllable pilot thing that we said is, man, I hope this shit works. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was all syllable, single syllables, um, and it did. But um, but you always were like, eh, you know, is it really going to work? And so the first mission, you had the advantage of having been able to study it for a long time and mm -hmm. kind of know every little, like the game board, you know, like an old Avalon yep. Hill game. You can sit there and look at it and kind of what if it, and so forth. But then there's always that, you know, the unknown. 
So, um, but then you just have to kind of go, okay, I have been trained and I know what to do. And all I'm doing is all this stuff that I've been trained how to do, navigate the aircraft, fly the aircraft, refuel the aircraft, get on a bomb run and go do it. And uh, the, the main thing that I remember is that time compression thing happens. You're, uh, you know, you're going through the switch. You know, okay, I gotta touch this button, touch that button, throw this switch, do this, do this. And normally that would have maybe taken, I don't know, 15 seconds or something. And I, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, on, the, I'm on the run, flip, and I go, okay, that's about two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, what do I do now? Um, I'll do it again. So, so yeah, the, the clock is just, you know, it's I'm literally ka-choom, ka-choom, <laughs> ka-choom. And you're like, well, and it's quiet and there's nobody shooting and, Okay, let me do it again. And so you you you're just you're you're trying to you're just and then after a while you're just narrowing down everything. It says, okay, I'm back on looking through the sensors, picking up the target, where's the target area? And then at some point you're just you're so into that, it's like, okay, I got one I got one foot closer, I got one more breath, I got one more heartbeat, let's get another, let's get another, let's get another, let's get another, until something says it's either it's either the target's gone or I'm gone. So you kind of that fades to the back of your mind for a while yeah. while you're you know you're you're pretty much on that and it's back to that low angle strafe pass. I'm not thinking about anything else other than that gun cross, that t- that tank. What's my distance? You know, what's mm-hmm. your, so that that same wheel is that hamster wheel is turning pretty fast, even though everything is all kind of just very stable and quiet up until weapon release, and that's when that's when things get interesting. So it, it, it's very much flying the set pattern, not doing anything that's going to spook anybody right. by, by doing anything. You then get to the moment for dropping the weapon. Yes. And what, what's the process there? Because you're saying, I guess, for, with the time dilation, it feels like you've been up there waiting for that yeah. moment for a yeah. lifetime. Yeah. Did time speed up? When you got to that point, or was nope. it again? <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know, then you've got a time time flight mm-hmm. on the weapon, and you still have to be uh, present and <clears throat> making sure that everything will will guide properly mm-hmm. to impact. So yeah, you're really mm-hmm. and, and even then you're you're getting more and more focused, mm-hmm. more and more very specific on the the impact point, and then it finally turns out that once once the kaboom happens, that's when okay, you know, now everybody's aware that you're there. <laughs> that's that's when the world erupts. Oh, so, ah, yes, of course. You see, even now, my brain's thinking you're flying into the fireworks, but they don't even know you're there until it, something goes it depend, back. It depends on the target. Yeah. I mean, Baghdad was such a big target and so well defended that in some cases it was the 4th of July, and I'm going to go fly through the 4th of July. Mm-hmm. Or maybe... Uh, Guy Fawkes Day <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah. for your, your folks at home there. Um, but uh, some of the other places that were still well defended, but um, maybe not as not as large with mm-hmm. a, a lot of guns, it was, they were kind of like, hmm, not, not much. And then all of a sudden, uh, having been on the ground and, and been underneath one fly over me, I, I kind of know sort of the process by which somebody kind of goes, what is that? Mm-hmm. And they they don't until later they didn't really get oh that's what that is, so the first couple of what is that's were like boom oh you know crap and then they then they wake up. What, what altitude were you going in at? Um, a lot of different altitudes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, depend. It depended yeah. on the target and what you were what you wanted to to hit. Yeah. Okay. You know, I I was. 12, 13 mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very strange for someone who'd grown up reading all those Second World War books and mm-hmm. things to, to see the things that, that you and your colleagues were, were doing, spe- especially in this new strange black plane mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. captured everybody's imagination. What was the experience for, for you being out there, being on a combat deployment for the first time? Uh, was it... Was it as you thought it would be, or was it 
a whole different experience because I, I suppose again that's where the training you're trained to suddenly have to go into this but what was the actual experience of being out there like? um it was it was it was um it was different in that suddenly it was 24 7 mm -hmm. you were working seven days a week we were literally living with the aircraft my uh, my bunk was in um, a hangar with three feet of concrete and there was an airplane on the other side of it, sometimes with the engines running because the maintenance people were working <laughs> while I was trying to sleep. Um, so there wasn't, you know, like, hey, you know, we're, let's go play around or whatever. You were just there to work. Yeah. And so it was just a question of, um, you know, what, what's, what's happening today? Am I, am I going up? And then, uh, you know, how much mission study time do I have? Or am I in you know, some backup duty? And where is that going to take me to the tower, to the command post, to whatever? Uh, but we were living on on the air in inside the airfield, airfield, um, and certainly weren't going off base. So you just really concentrated on that, and it was just a question of what was it? Uh, the MRE, the MREs, the barbecued pork with accessory packet B. <laughs> that was a big deal because it had a little bottle of Tabasco in it. Oh. So yeah, you, then you, you know, so the, you're you're into those kind of little things. Yeah. So well, I'm gonna I'm start hoarding a accessory <laughs> packet B, so that I have some uh, some spice to put on the food. You know that type of thing. Yeah. Fantastic. The okay. He, here's the other thing. You're there with your your new shiny toy. Mm -hmm. Your colleagues then actually get to fly the profile that you'd spent ten years on on the hog. What was that like watching? the aircraft finally get to do what it was designed for, especially, especially those, the operations in the, in the retreat from Kuwait that sort of really cemented the reputation of it, the hog. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was very satisfying because, um, yeah, the airplane was designed to do a certain job. Um, in some ways, uh, Iraq was, was almost custom made for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I wouldn't say that we went anywhere with impunity, uh, we certainly were kind of, you know, we were gritting our teeth about going certain places, but we were still able to go and, and get the job done. I mean, there's there's always the, I mean, the worst thing when it was all said and done was the weather. Mm -hmm. The weather uh, just killed us from a standpoint of not being able to drop. Um, for my 22 missions, I ended up on average dropping one bomb per mission, but that was because some missions I dropped none because I flew around in the clouds for hours and hours and drop nothing you know because I, I suppose that's one of those misconceptions that came out of it because the, the briefings that we all watched mm -hmm. on CNN of, of perfect drops and you know, still remember the truck going across the bridge when mm -hmm. the, the bomb hits it just behind weather conditions are still playing havoc with with carefully planned operations back then yeah, yes. yeah. so you know it, it wasn't maybe as clear cuss as, as we at home were, were being told. You, know, you, you, were, you were having well you know, interesting it's, issues. It's, 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 it's like anything else. It's, uh, it's, uh, you, you work with the state of the art of what you have, mm -hmm. and then you learn what its um, shortcomings are, and then you work to overcome that. Yeah. And so for me, the interesting thing was leaving that assignment, going to Eglin Air Force Base, where weapons development is taking place and then watching all this stuff start coming down the pipe from the lessons learned from from uh, uh, Desert Storm. This is a question I asked, I asked Russ yesterday as well. The, how does the experience that you got of flying, flying those those missions then get applied to, we'll keep this abstract, to, to, to the development that you got uh, involved in later? How, what is that sort of knowledge transfer from, from you at the, the pointy end hmm. to the development teams that are trying to allow a weapon to be dropped through cloud it's, accurately? Um, it was extremely valuable, but at the same time, the, if, there was any, if there was any problem we had, it was that we were so classified that nobody knew what the airplane could do. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we would come back and say, well, we did this, and they go, no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm reminded of what of Monty Python. No, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I can remember being in a in a classified meeting after I had left, and somebody said, "Oh, well, you know, if we were wanting to make a 
if we were wanting to do this, uh, nobody can nobody can do that. And I'm like, excuse me, but yes, and here's here's why. And and, and you just see all these heads and eyes look over like what? It's like oh yeah, you know, and like right now, like for years we've been doing it. And then you see this kind of well, crap that just changed all of our you know these are engineers and you know program managers and things. Like, okay, what are we going to do about this? You know. So it, it was, uh, it was, and it wasn't an ego thing. It was just, no, this is a very matter of fact. In the light of day, here's what can be done with what we got now. And here's what the shortcomings are. And then everybody, then you had to just find people who could A, hear that and B, understand it and C, take action. But uh, yeah, I felt in my own small way I was able to provide that to a, a broader audience, a weapons development audience, mm -hmm. that said, "Oh, yeah, we could do this, or we, you know, here's what the possibilities are." Let's let's start wrapping up. And what I'm going to ask this question because this is a, a classic plain geek question. Say that again. I said this is a classic classic plain geek question. Plain geek. Yeah. Yeah. The A10 has been supposedly ready for retirement now for about 20 years and it's mm -hmm. still flying around well why do you think it's had the longevity that it has because nothing else can do that job period yeah. next question <laughs> well <laughs> there's yeah. nothing on yeah. the horizon that yeah. can do that job whoever thinks they can do that job they haven't yeah. flown an a10 they just it's it's ugly. It's not stealthy, but it's that blunt instrument that you need in a in a fight. Mm -hmm. And well, so here's um, there was a I was an instructor here, and we were going to do dissimilar air combat against an F-15 driver. <laughs> and the uh, F-15 <laughs> driver, <laughs> in his way, uh, he didn't have his pinky up when he was drinking his tea, but he he then he was going to recite to us the different air to air weapons that he had and he was relating them to sort of a knight's weapons you know mm -hmm. the the aim seven is you know like a javelin you know you can throw that a long way and the aim nine is more like the lance and the gun is more like a sword and you know this we had this whole i'm sitting there with a student and and so he says and so how would you characterize your um your air to air weapon i said well the the A-10 is kind of like a baseball bat with a nail in it. <laughs> and that's all I said. And I just looked at him like, you know, whatever expletive you want to put at the end of that. And, and he went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, it, it, it may have trouble hitting you, but if it does, it's going to hurt. And, and, he was, and that kind of ended the discussion. And, and that gun, there is nothing like that gun. I mean, the... Um, there are some some big guns on some special operations aircraft, AC-130s, things like that. But flying it around, uh, flying it around with an A-10 with a 30 millimeter Gatling gun, there's nothing else like that. We're going to change subject completely so, now because you have another passion, sir, which is archaeology. Yes, especially in in this in this particular area as well. Yes, but. Interestingly, you're, you're using drones to help map and understand the mm -hmm. settlements of, 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 of the First Nations in this area. I just was wanting to ask you a little bit about that. What, what, what are you doing? What, what have you been finding and how has that been? Well, um, the, the interesting thing about the drone, and this is just a commercial drone, mm -hmm. no big deal. You can buy one at Walmart if you want to. Um, and so the, uh, the drone is not an aircraft as, as I would have characterized an aircraft. It's a robot. Yep. It's a robotic um, aircraft. And sometimes you can pilot it, and sometimes you're an operator. So with my students, and I, I, have, I have quite a few drone students. We, we, we teach it through an independent study thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I try and relate sort of my experiences from now 50 plus years of, of aviation experience to this little robot. And so, yeah, I say, so today we're going to do pilot shit, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but to do archaeology, you have to be an operator. You have to learn how to operate it. But the, the, the F-117 was probably one of the greatest teachers for me is that 
I hate computers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust electronics. And the drones are full of electronics and computers. So um, I, I bring that sort of an attitude that says, yeah, it's, it's, it does great, but don't trust that it's going to do the same thing every time. But the, the, the nuance that you can develop by stitching the photographs together and making a map where you can erase the vegetation mm -hmm. yep. and see a depression in the ground maybe 10 centimeters or less deep, is one of the, it, it, it still stunned me. At my age, I went, oh my God, look at that. And then you go back to the picture and you go, and that's underneath vegetation. So if you were standing there looking at it, you wouldn't even know what's there. Yeah. Um, so those are that's sort of the magic of, of what you can do with with that technology, and and that's the piece that I try and, and pass on to the younger generations is um, be willing to ask a question, but be willing to accept a different answer than the one you were expecting, mm -hmm. but don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to go out there and try, and don't be afraid to uh, look at a piece of technology and decide. Yeah, that can. How can that help me? This is the way it's designed to help me. But how can I use it to do something else? That that's been sort of a forte of mine, with whether it's been baseball bats with nails in it, <laughs> or, or or drones. You know, that's fantastic, John. Thank you so much for for your time today. You're welcome. And uh, we are going to pop out and actually see the the black aircraft. In a bit. Well, it's kind of gray and wrinkled like I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll you'll see it. You'll see her in her uh, in her altogether state right now. But hopefully, hopefully they'll be dressing her up before too long. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. That's going to go on for like ten or fifteen minutes. That's fine. It's okay. It's great background. So. Here we are. Here we are. Next to she's rather silver now that she's been. Like I said, gray and wrinkled like me. Yep. <laughs> and. I guess this is one of those questions you're probably just going to smile at me here for. Maybe. They've removed all the, the fancy bits, yes. shall we say. Yes. So she's not as pointy as she, she once was. Correct. What, what are the things that we should look out for when we actually get to see one of these things that you are allowed to talk about as we, as we go around it? Well, um, I think it was, it's along the lines of one of the things you said during the interview is that it doesn't look like an airplane. <laughs> um, even look, standing here looking at it, it still doesn't look like an airplane. Um, and that's because stealth was the number one consideration. So just, I guess, look at the diamond shapes, mm -hmm. all those diamond shapes. That's just one aspect of, of the stealth of it. But they, they've thought about, if you think, if you look at everything that's supposed to be, that would normally be like square or curved, it's pointy. Yep. Uh, look at the gear doors. Look at the, that panel right there. Uh, look at the, the leading edge of the canopy. Um, even the, the intakes. The, everything has a slant to it and a, a pitch to it that's meant to prevent radar from coming back to its source. So nothing flat enough to give it a, a, a straight return? Essentially. Yeah. One question I had. The Bombay doors, though, were quite square. They? Nope. Were they not? Okay. No. Right. You can, if you kneel down, you can see them right there. Oh yeah. Oh, and they do have the. They, they've got the, the serrated, the, the, the serrated, the serrated edges edge on, on, on the front on the fence as well. Yeah. It's, it, oh, it, it's very pretty, even for something that's ungainly. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It. It. it uh, we used to say that when you look at it from the front, it looks like Darth Vader. You know, just, <laughs> so. I'm. I'm just very aware that you're going to smile at me for a few of these questions. Not at all. But Not at all. What sort of, this is a very technical one, as you're flying, you're saying you're going to make minimal movements as you could. What sort of angle of banks would you be making your turns at when you're within radar coverage? As little as possible. So just little gentle turns as you're going, yeah. nothing, nothing fancy. And what does, I guess you're listening constantly for anything that the sensors are picking up. Are you actually hearing very much, or what, what, what can you tell that you know you need to maybe change your profile slightly? Um, well, there's the, the whole problem is there's not much you can do about it. So <laughs> you tend to just kind of say, well, que sera, <laughs> <laughs> or que sera if you're speaking Spanish. Um, so, yeah, you just you kind of knew where, where things were supposed to be. But the problem with a mobile battlefield, you know, if somebody has a mobile SAM, they could be anywhere. Yeah. So 
that was part of the problem is like, well, we, we took our best whack at it and we're just going to follow this line and go see what happens. So when you were hot prepping the aircraft on the walkarounds, what would you be looking looking for for things that might be out of shape? Because, you know, a, a standard walkaround, you're going, yeah. checking checking the control surfaces, things like that. For an aircraft like this, what additionally are you looking well, for? Well, first of all, that there there's no dents or dings, you mm -hmm. know, nothing that's going to affect the, the RCS, the radar cross yeah. section. Um, so in that respect, it's just sort of a standard walk around. Um, everything's where it should be. Um, the tires, like those tires, obviously are not serviceable. <laughs> um, they've seen a few too many landings, things like that. Um, but then you, more specifically, uh, in, in this case, the, the bays would be open. You could access the weapons. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain settings that were supposed to be on that weapon that were geared for whatever target um, that aircraft was going after. And so then... The walk around itself was fairly fairly quick, but then get in, start the engines, spin everything up, and everything is does everything work? Mm -hmm. Is everything as it should be? Um, so literally at that point, I could just have them pull the chocks and go fly the mission. Right. Okay. So that that's that's what we tried to get it to to minimize the chance of the, the guy coming out getting in and going, oh, this didn't work. Mm -hmm. If there was any chance of us catching it beforehand, that that was what. Mm -hmm my job was and it mostly had to do with the internal you know with yeah. all the brains and you know all the boxes were doing what yeah. the boxes should be doing yeah so take off hit a tanker mm -hmm. and then form up and and head in would you be going in on on your own or would you have friends with you um we we generally flew as a two ship uh, when we left mm -hmm. and but uh Essentially, once you once you were crossing the line, you were on your own, okay. um, and you weren't talking to anybody. You'll notice there's a distinct lack of projections, even from this old girl. Uh, they're there, and you have to look a little bit closely to see them, but uh, they're there. But essentially, you sucked it all in, and it it was very quiet and peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> just became For a hole, a, hole in the sky. About an hour and a half to two hours of just per, peace and quiet until everybody started shooting. You know? So we, we, were, we were saying after we finished chatting in the other room, it was about a seven hour, seven hour ish, yeah. ish round about that. Yeah. Let's get to the basics here. And by basics, I mean, what happens if you need to use the loo? Uh, piddle pack. <laughs> it's, it's basically a little Ziploc bag with a dehydrated sponge. Mm. And um, luckily this airplane, the autopilot was quite good. So you could just turn on the autopilot and go on about your, about your business. And then... Um, for uh, for anything uh, more than that, you, we basically ate um, high protein, mm -hmm. you know, low residue kind yep. of foods, so that you didn't have any issues until you got back. That and then, then you had issues. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, we'll, we'll we'll move swiftly on well, from that. Pro, you know, high protein eggs, meat, yeah. those types mm -hmm. of things. So you then had to hydrate quite well in order to to clear that out. So that's what the accessory packet B was for, with the, with the, with the, <laughs> Despite the spices, with the tobacco, yeah. Tabasco, yeah. Get things going. Yeah. With with something as as cutting edge as this, what would go wrong with it? Because it's you know it's it's something that is still I see even in operation was quite experimental. So, um, uh, just like I said, the box is not doing what the box is supposed to be doing. And uh, it could be any, any number of, of boxes. I, I had a couple of instances where you, you get off the tanker, you're going to go meet and greet somebody, and you go, where is this thing taking me? <laughs> <laughs> and then you start trying to sort that out, and it's like, well, uh, we're not going tonight because it's, it doesn't want to go there. So um, I've, I've told other interviewers that uh, these things do have a personality of their own, and you have to kind of learn... It's almost like a horse or any other creature that you deal with. It's like, this one doesn't like that. This one doesn't like doing this or it doesn't want to. So how do you then convince it to do that? In some cases, there were some nights where it's like, no, we're, we're, not, we're not going to the dance tonight. We're going home. So, so you've got, you got to get to know its, it's quirks, its own yeah, personality. Yeah, yeah. There were a couple. There was one in particular that I was, after the third, third time was a charm, I told the maintenance people, I said, if you give me that airplane again, I will. I'm just going to get out right off the end of the runway, and I'm just going to punch out of it. <laughs> They're like, 
you're not kidding. I said, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> because the last three times I almost left it out somewhere in the desert, maybe with me in it, you know. So, no. It's... It's 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 fascinating to be stood next stood next to one this mm -hmm. close, and seeing them put back together. She's going to look great when they when they finish with her. But I guess one of the things that you you, you you're not going to answer this really is a lot of the things that we see on the airframe now are pretty standard air, aircraft airframe structure. All the stuff that's missing is 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 the fancy stuff, um, but. What level of sort of concern when you're looking at, you're saying the dents and things like that, if you had a dent in the bits that aren't here now, would that increase your visibility a lot or? It was going to change it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was hard to say if it was going to make it better or worse, but you assumed that it was going to make it worse. So then something, if it was detected early enough, we could, we'd have something yeah. done about it. But it's, I guess the sort of, your philosophy of thinking of what you need to look for mm -hmm. when you're getting ready mm -hmm. is quite different because it's, yeah. Yeah. It, so, yeah, this, I don't know, the the leading edge, uh, which was essentially, if you think, if you look at it, the leading edge was a straight line from nose to the wingtip. Mm -hmm. And so I, in particular, spent a fair amount of time kind of literally going down the leading edge looking at and it wasn't razor sharp but it was for for a leading edge it's pretty damn sharp mm -hmm. so um and at least for somebody my size it was a good place to knock my head <laughs> so hopefully no other tall guy ran into it and and dented the, the leading edges for instance i've no, i've no, this is the first time i've i've ever seen one in, mm -hmm. in the flesh and mm -hmm. it is it's quite impactful because it's all these flat panels yeah. and weird angles, and they have, they just, they defy, it defies uh, explanation as an aircraft. It just, <laughs> that, and it's one of those things where when you see it flying, it, you know, you see it sideways, or she sees it from the bottom or the top, it's a completely different shape mm. every time. So you could see it three different ways, and you'd think you saw three different UFOs or something yeah. flying through the air. It, I, the thing that keeps popping into my head is it doesn't look right, but it does look right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we're saying this is this is a stealth aircraft. You go, well, yes. But yeah. then if you were to say F sixteen over there, which is you know, a, a classically a classic fighter mm -hmm. aircraft, mm -hmm. it's it, which you would probably say is aesthetically different. Yes, I'm not going to say more or less <laughs> pretty. pleasing. You're going <laughs> yeah. to use that yeah, biased but, word of pleasing. But when you say you know this aircraft is literally to hide in the dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks exactly like it should do. Yeah, it's and it's it, it's it's shaped for what it's meant to do, and that is that's the beauty of it. That's yeah. its own beauty. This function, it's it's purpose built. I can hear the affection in your voice. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's even though you're banging your head on the on the cockpit <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, there may be some dents in that one. I, I flew this one home from the desert. I, I landed this in. Uh, uh, at Nellis um, on 1 April, 1991, April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> what what was that transit? How long was the transit back? Was um, it one go or did you stop? No, it was, it was three three hops, uh, Camis to Zaragoza, Zaragoza to Langley and Langley to Nellis. And then of our, I think it was eight aircraft. I can't remember how many airplanes we brought back, but uh, four of us went into Nellis, several went to Tonopah, several went straight to the, the depot for refurbishment. Mm -hmm. So we kind of scattered somewhere over Utah, I think, or yeah. New Mexico, and sent airplanes to different locations. Because I guess they, they needed a bit of TLC when you got back, because oh, you yeah. flew them hard for, the, oh, for yeah. that campaign. Yeah. Um, we, as I said, we as pilots were flying on average every other night. These things, at some point, were going up there twice a night. Wow. Towards the end of the yeah. war, they were making two trips a night, Goodness. seven and a half hour ish trips. So yeah, we we um, it's it's almost like you know the, the, you're looking at a Formula One type of machine that's being that's driving two flat out races every day. Mm -hmm. And think about the amount of work that goes into something like that. Yes. Versus a real Formula One where you know you drive the shit out of it. Sorry, <laughs> for the race for whatever that is, two and a half hours, 
and then it doesn't yeah. see another uh, track for a week. Yeah. You know. it, it's designed just to last that long. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That's that's the thing that most people don't realize is, and even with the A10s, um, mm-hmm. when I was across the street at Davis Monthan, um, even though they're not fast aircraft, we were flying those things flat out, somewhere between two and four times a day. Mm. So imagine imagine that kind of uh, TLC that needs to go into a machine to keep it in that sort of top fighting condition, yep. racing condition, however you want to state that. That's a that's that's quite a. A feather in the cap for the maintainers and the people who uh, who keep them keep them up there. Because yeah, yeah that, that's the old story. You, you guys break them and they have to put them back yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes they broke on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I broke a couple, but there were some that were just bound to determine they were gonna. They just didn't want. They didn't like me. <laughs> Here's another silly question. Yes, sir. I'm very good at so stuff. far. I, I will credit you with not having asked any silly questions, by the way. So let, just, let me let me try. Just, let me try. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to try harder. Okay. Look, looking at <laughs> what what should I be looking for as something that is is unique that you're allowed to talk about really because I, I know there's, okay. there's a whole bunch of sure. bits, but I'm looking right at it right, right. All so right. you look in the intake here okay Ramon yes. look in the intake yes come here cameraman let's you see that see that uh, that piece of aluminum hanging down there yep so what the hell is that yeah. so if you walk a little closer you look up through there and there's daylight showing showing on the top of the intake yep so that was the blow in door oh right so this bit right here had um, a grid across it, which mm-hmm. I f- affectionately call the ice cube trays. <laughs> so when you flew into nasty weather, and this time of, as a matter of fact, uh, we're in the anniversary season of Desert Storm right now. Yeah. This is when the war was mm-hmm. going on. So these things would ice completely over okay. and block. And so then what would happen is the engine, of course, is going to suck air from wherever it can. So then that the, the, air, the vacuum would just literally pull that door down oh, and right. open up. And then you got a light in the cockpit that said BID, blow indoor. Your ICS has changed. Yeah. Oh, by the way. But that bit is um, is basically just uh, uh, one of those gas struts. Okay. So then once the vacuum was less, i.e. the, the ice melted, then the blow the blow door would close, and then you ran your air through the normal inlet. So you, you that would all happen on... On its own, as, as the pressure changed yes, in the, the icing it, wood yeah, too. That yeah. would happen automatically as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this uh, bit right here is going to look familiar for anybody who has a car. This is where your your uh, wiper went. There was a wiper that went in this channel that you could turn it on and it would try to clear the stuff off the uh, the inlet. Uh, but so it was a it, big windshield wiper. It, an incredibly stealthy. Secret airplane with windshield wipers over the inlet. Yes. Yeah. They weren't stealthy when you used them, so you had to be <laughs> very kind of, uh, you know, judicious about how you did that. But, uh, and I'll say it didn't work worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a licorice snow cone. <laughs> if you, if there is a black, the black licorice, mm-hmm. all I would do is I'd have a flashlight and I'd shine the light down on the intake and you could see out the window and it's like, oh, Jesus, you know, this dark. <laughs> Um, ice gob on the in the front of this thing. I, I guess that's the other question with icing on on all the usual places that icing mm-hmm. is usually on angles, pointy bits. You've got a lot of angles and pointy bits on this. Yeah. How I guess icing was one of your big your big worries on on a normal flight. Or? Um, it, it was, but it was. Uh, I mean, I don't know what icing does to the RCS. I don't yeah. think it changes. It's just well, it's that, water. It, yeah. yeah. But um. Yeah, I mean the aerodynamics. The aerodynamics were secondary to stealth. Mm. So if you go back, let's go back to the, the the wing line here, and you can kind of see the lack of curvature. But you can see the airfoil, if you want to call it that. Mm. And uh, so it probably wouldn't take much to disrupt the airflow over this um, again diamond-shaped um, bit right here. So still looking down the leading edge. If you back up a little bit more, you can see there's just it goes from a slope to a flat. Oh, I can see. I yeah. Know. Oh, this, yeah, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> and then it slopes back down again. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, it's not a classic airfoil shape. Not a classic yeah. airfoil shape, and therefore probably subject to uh, disruption mm-hmm. by something like icing, pretty easily. But I, I, again, it's you just cope with that and as needs be. Yeah. 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 
Well, and you weren't asking a lot out of it. You yeah. Know, again, you're being fairly sneaky about it. So, you know, if you had done some kind of some kind of Hayaka turn, you might have gotten a root surprise yeah. from that. But we weren't asking asking that of the aircraft. Thing things like recovery. Yeah, you know, we were talking earlier about in training spinning things. If this went into a spin, <laughs> <laughs> was I guess that's big trouble. Nope. Yep. Nope. Y- Don't you, do it. It's, yeah. You pull the yellow handles and there take was a, the term wobbling goblin, wobbly goblin, was there for a reason. So some of the early on guys got to experience that. Ooh, I, right. I never did, and I never did want to. So, so you treat treat it nice, and it treats yeah. you nicer. Yeah. I, I've always been fascinated by the um, the uh, the. Of course, I'm on camera. Tailpipe? Tailpipe, yeah. yeah. It being flat. Which is not a pipe, by the it's, way. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a harmonica yeah. shape. And yeah. it's, that's always seemed a, a very strange structure for that. Because, yeah, we're, we're surrounded by all kinds of jets of, of different yeah. shapes. Oh, the one thing that they all have in common is a, a round pipe at the back. Mm-hmm. Whereas here we've got a big rectangular slot. Yeah. That, I guess, again, for radar cross-section. Well, not but, just for radar <laughs> cross-section, but for uh, infrared. Ah, yeah, diffusion as well. So would it's, and I, I guess that's how they then were able to to track them a bit later over, over the Balkans, wasn't it? It was something, something like. Again, I'm getting the, smi- I'm getting the smile. Uh, Beats me. Yes, um, there's, we'll, we'll we'll move on. That guy's but, a friend of mine, by the way. But oh, right. Yeah. It's um, it's just a, an, another sort of aspect where everything is going to yeah. the func- the form is going straight exactly. to the function. Exactly. And, what, did it did it notice? Was it noticeable? that you had like something like this coming out did that mean flight characteristics or was it just so different to normal that you just got used to the whole thing as a package or um, were you noticing little quirks on it just you? just the overall lack of thrust yeah. i mean the the engine itself was a tf 404 mm-hmm. so uh same engine in, as in the f-18 yep not after burning of course but um i credit that as being a pretty damn good engine um I know that it eats ice. It, it just it just ate the, the, the dickens out of it. But um, yeah, when you take the round pipe that feeds out of the 404 and then you step on it, step on the beer can and flatten it out, uh, you're going to lose efficiency. You're going to lose thrust. And so, but it just became part and parcel of operating the aircraft. It was under thrusted, or at least it was at the altitudes we were operating. So you just, you know, acted accordingly. Yep. Even from this angle, it, this is this angle is very science fictiony. Yeah, yeah. This this is you know, Battlestar Galactica sort of, sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, right here. yeah. It it must have been pretty cool having this as the day job. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. There, there there's other there's other cool things just to to illustrate. So right there, that silver piece, yep. that's uh, where the drag chute goes. Okay. So um, you notice that there's there's two. Whatever the hell they were called, uh, flapperons or flapper doodles or something. <laughs> um, but they that w- that was there was two of these on each wing and the tail fins and that's it. Yep. Uh, as far as flaps or speed brakes, there was there was no drag devices. So mm-hmm. once you hit the ground, and oh by the way, these brakes were not the world's greatest. That drag chute better work, um, otherwise you were either um, going to heat the you know probably going to blow the tires or you were going to go into the barrier to uh, to get stopped. So very dependent on on old technology drag chutes mm-hmm. to make it work. So fully loaded with minimal minimal flappage as well. I guess you had to be going some to get it off the off the ground. So you got oh uh, yeah min, um, min, minimal thrust and what what sort of were you retaining um, at? It was it was very it was similar to the A10 actually. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time it got sporting was uh, <clears throat> if you if you didn't drop and you came back and you had a pretty heavy fuel load. Mm-hmm. And then you were in a pretty high-speed tricycle once you landed on the on the uh, on the runway. I will say that I would I would give a Formula One car a run for its money <laughs> on one of the two landing rolls that I did that were Oof. like much faster than I really cared to. <laughs> with three wheels. Oof, with three wheels, and not very big wheels either. No, yeah. so they're spinning very that little that little nose wheel is going at a high RPM at close to 200 knots. <laughs> I. This again, another silly question. No, you're still over. No, I'm, I'm, however many. You're, you're being very nice to me, John. That's, that's fair. 
all aircraft have their own sort of sounds and things that you're, you're listening mm -hmm. out for. Mm -hmm. What what was it like flying in this? Because I would assume the airflow over it would be making quite different noises to a normal aircraft. Were you listening out for anything in particular, for say, a, 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 a sensor door open that shouldn't be or something flapping? Would you would you know that in the cockpit, or were you quite quiet and tucked away? Up there? It was pretty quiet and tucked away. I'm I'm think I'm having to think back. I'm try, I'm going back in time, you know, decades to go. Well, you know, like um, one of the one of the things, especially at night mm -hmm. or over the middle of the ocean, you know, one of the things that gets you gets your attention is the hydraulic accumulator mm -hmm. uh, in certain aircraft because it it goes kachunk as as it recharges itself after you've used like a if you put the gear down or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't recall there being a whole lot of, of very much of anything, uh, sound-wise, with this thing. It, um, it remarkably, as as goofy as all these angles look like, this is a very sleek design, and it would, it would, it would go fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, upper, you know, high subsonic, but um, it liked to go fast. Mm -hmm. If you slowed down, then it would kind of start to. It was like a speedboat, so then you got to. You're up on the plane, and yeah. then, uh, but it wouldn't give you a whole lot of departure characteristics or anything like that. And like I said, I was never very curious to discover what those were. I'm just blown away by this, and I can't thank you enough for again You're spending welcome. a bit of time pointing out some some sure. bits on your old bird, and of sure. course the bits that we're not allowed to talk about, which aren't here. Yeah, yeah. There we are. But she looks great with the tail on, and yeah. even even with yeah. the leading edge, not not here yet. And yeah, uh, it, yeah, it did. It looks. Yeah, you're right. It looks like it's going fast, even though it's sitting yeah. down again. Yeah. So, so thank you so much. You're welcome. I can't thank John and the team at Pima enough for setting that up and for John's time as well. He was super generous with his answers and we talked about all kinds of stuff. Some of the other record stuff was fantastic as well. I wish I could share that, but it was off the record. The aircraft at the moment is undergoing restoration for going out and display out in the yard there at Pima. So there'll be some fantastic imagery coming from that, which I hope to share over the next little while. As always, I can't thank Pima enough for sponsoring the podcast and for all the hard work they went to to set up some incredible guests while I was out there. And there are more of these interviews coming. We have a Huey gunship crew chief. We've got B-17 pilots. We've got THUD drivers. Seriously, there's some great stuff coming. Those episodes all come out on the first podcast of the month. So watch this space. Your support of the podcast is what keeps it going. And I cannot thank you enough. Usual requests, pop some stars, leave some reviews in your podcast app of choice. Tell your friends, tweet about it, post about it. There's a thing called TikTok, apparently. Talk, tick about it. I don't know. I have to ask my daughter about that one. And of course, if you fancy it, there's Patreon as well, where you get these episodes early with slightly different intros and outros. The little videos that we're doing for the mid-rolls as well will be shown there first. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Next week, we have the fabulous Paul Beaver joining us to talk about Winkle, his new biography of his friend, Captain Eric Brown, Britain's greatest test pilot, trademark. It's a fantastic book and it's a great chat. Until then, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourself. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.